historical Jesus. Number nine, Jewish groups. In order to understand the life of Jesus, the times of Jesus, it's helpful to understand what groups were around in his time. And so what I want to do is look at with you four major Jewish groups, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, and the Zealots, and really get a handle on those four groups. And I, I realize that, for example, the Essenes are not mentioned in the New Testament, but they were there in the time of Jesus. And by looking at these different groups, it'll show you how different Jewish people um, responded to the issues of their day, what were the issues of, of their day, how do they respond, and this will help us to see Jesus in his own context, but also how he shines di in a different way than the other groups that are around. So I want to do that in the first uh, part tonight. In the second part, we'll look at conflict and how Jesus uh, and these groups uh, battled it out in different cases. So to start with, I want to begin with this quote from Josephus. He says, the Jews had for a great while had three sects of philosophy peculiar to themselves the sect of the Essenes, the sect of the Sadducees, and the third sort of opinions was that of those called Pharisees. Josephus himself was a Pharisee, so he tends to say very nice things about the Pharisees all the time. Um, and uh, then he says, he goes on, but of the fourth sect of Jewish philosophy, and that is the, the group that I'm calling the Zealots, the fourth sect there. And so there's known to be these four groups at the time of Jesus, or at least in the first century, we could say. Two centuries before Jesus began his ministry, a Greek empire ruled over the land of Israel. So this is before the Romans, the Greeks ruled over the land of Israel. This empire outlawed the law of Moses, the Torah, and defiled the temple by sacrificing a pig to an idol there. This caused a revolution led by the Hasmonean family who presided over Israel from 167 to 63 B.C. So that's nearly a century that the Hasmoneans were in charge. This is not described in our Bibles. This is the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, but it was recent history for the time of Christ. So it's helpful for us uh, to get familiar with this a little bit at least. Um, anyhow, this Hasmonean family, they won their religious freedom and eventually political freedom. During this period, several groups emerged, including the Pharisees, Essenes, and Sadducees. And so these groups occur nowhere in our Old Testament. And they, once we get to the New Testament, they're just there. And there's no explanation as to where they came from, what they believe. You know, you get little snippets here and, and there about it. But it all began with this man, Mattathias, who initiated a revolution in the year 167 against the Greek uh, Seleucids who were forcing people, village by village, to sacrifice to idols. And Mattathias took a stand with his family with him, and they started a revolution. Mattathias and his sons uh, were of the priestly line. So they, they were of the tribe of Levi, and they were priests within that tribe. Uh, about a year into the revolution, his son, Judah the Maccabee, took over, and he was able to capture the temple and cleanse it, and that's celebrated by the holiday Hanukkah. Uh, the, the word Maccabee, by the way, is, uh, we believe it means hammer, if it gives you a little idea of his uh, military prowess here. He's a, a fierce military leader. Then his, when he dies, his brother, Jonathan Aphis takes over, another son of Mattathias, from 160 to 143, and he achieves religious freedom from the Greeks, and he becomes a high priest in the year 153. And so a high priest is a spiritual leader of the people. It's the person who's allowed to go into the holiest place of the temple, uh, but it's also for this man, for Jonathan, and subsequent of these Has Hasmoneans, the high priest is also the leader of the nation as well. And then he died and left his brother Simon in charge. This is the third of three brothers to be in charge. Simon Thassi, from 142 to 135, he's the high priest. He achieves political freedom. He, achie he achieves independence. And so from his day up until the year 63, when the Romans come, 
Israel is a free country, more or less. I mean, it's complicated, more a little more complicated than that. But they're not, uh, they're, they're ruling themselves. They're not, you know, having to pay taxes to the, the Greeks to um, keep them happy. So anyhow, after Simon, a man named John Hyrcanus got to the throne. And uh, Hyrcanus is the, the first time we hear about the Pharisees and the Sadducees during this man's rule. And so he's in charge of this territory. He conquers Samaria and Idumea and expands the territory of Judah. Uh, And he's in charge for 30 years, 134 to 104 B.C. Um, He was made uh, the high priest, um, and he originally had supported the Pharisees, but they offended him. They insulted his mother, and you just don't ever do that. And so he shifted allegiance, and he became a very strong supporter of the Sadducees and put them in power. He minted coins, not even Solomon or David did that, and he was uh, a conqueror. His son, uh, Judah Aristobulus, or Aristobulus, was made the high priest in his father's will, but I guess there was something about his son that he didn't trust because he put his wife in charge, which would be this guy's mother, in charge of the actual government, while Judah Aristobulus was in charge of the high priesthood. However, he didn't go for that, so he, he locked away his mother in a uh, jail and starved her to death and took over the rulership and the high priesthood. He conquered Galilee. Um, this was, you know, about 100 years before Christ was born. And he's the first Hasmonean to declare himself king. And so now you have a king, priest, combined in the same person. But this infuriated the Pharisees. And look, this guy only lasted one year, too. I mean, he got a lot done in one year. Um, This infuriated the Pharisees because they believed that the king should be a son of David. And these guys were priests. So they felt felt that he had no reason to be there. Um, And uh, he only lasted a year. So he died, and his brother, Alexander Janaeus, took over. And he ran from 103 to 76. He conquered Ituria and some other territory. He married Aristobulus's widow, Salome Alexandra. Salome Alexandra becomes important in just a minute. So just to get that straight, Alexander is the son of John Hyrcanus, just like his brother Aristobulus. So Janaeus and Aristobulus are brothers. Janaeus dies, so, uh, or Aristobulus dies, so Janaeus marries the widow. Why do you want to marry the widow? I'm not really sure, but it's illegal for a high priest, according to the law of Moses, to marry a widow. And so that upsets a lot of people. At some point, the group known as the Essenes, about whom I will describe more later, uh, at some point they say, this priesthood is so corrupt, we're gone. We're out of here. This, this whole system's bad news. Uh, and, I, and I don't know if that was during the time of Alexander Janaeus when the high priest marries a widow, which would have been against the law, or if it was earlier um, when uh, some of these other high priests took control. So anyhow, Alexander Janaeus, um, the, the Pharisees did not like that he was calling himself king either. And so they said to him, you have to choose king or priest. You can't be both. And so what he did is he said, I am going to be both, and I'm going to empower the Sadducees and go with them. And so they adopted Sadducean rites in the temple And this caused the Pharisees to instigate a civil war that lasted six years, during which time 50,000 Judeans died. And wouldn't you know it, Alexander Janaeus, in the end, proved to be the victor and defeated the Pharisees and had 800 Pharisees crucified. And while they were uh, struggling with their life ebbing away on the crosses, he brought their wives and children before their eyes and slit their throats just to give you an idea of the character of this man. And then on his deathbed, he told his wife to make friends with the Pharisees. And so then his wife, Salome Alexandra, who had been very close to power this whole time, becomes the queen. And uh, she is not the high priest, but she does uh, become the queen. She's, by all accounts, a good queen. Uh, She reigns from 76 to 67. The only other queen that Israel ever had was a very bad queen, so I'm glad they got a good one, too, um, here during this period. Alexander had left the government with her, not his sons. 
So I don't know what that says. But maybe she was a little more competent than they were. We'll see in just a second. Her brother was a Pharisee leader. So uh, he, she, she basically put the Pharisees in charge, whereas the Sadducees had been in charge. Now it flips back to the Pharisees during her reign, and they use the opportunity to settle a lot of scores and uh, kill many of their opponents, especially the aristocrats that had been in charge since the days of uh, Alexander Janaeus. She has two sons, Hyrcanus II and Aristobulus II. Hyrcanus II uh, is a supporter of the Pharisees. Aristobulus II is a Sadducee supporter. Um, Hyrcanus is in charge for about three months when his brother decides, no, I, I think I should be in charge. And there's another civil war between these two brothers. Aristobulus wins, and he lasts for, from 67 to 63. Uh, but the war and the, the unrest continues, and what ends up happening is the Romans come, and the, the Roman general Pompey captures Jerusalem in 63, and that's the end, more or less, of the Hasmonean dynasty. So what I'm telling you is the Pharisees and the Sadducees had bad blood between them, literally. And it, it's not a recent disagreement in the time of Jesus. I mean, these groups had gone back for over a century fighting with each other, trying to sway the person in power to support their way of doing things in Jerusalem. I want to share with you just a, a few quotes about the Pharisees. This comes from Shay Cohen, who writes, Practically all scholars now agree that the name Pharisee derives from the Hebrew and Aramaic parush or parushi, in the plural parushim, which means one who is separated. And I don't believe the Pharisees call themselves Pharisees. I think it's a name other people call them. So they're the separated ones. Um, this is a quote from Josephus, himself a Pharisee. And so he says, They are extremely influential among the masses. And all prayers and sacred rites of divine worship are performed according to their exposition. Whenever the Sadducees assume some office, Though they submit unwillingly and perforce, yet submit they do to the dictates of the Pharisees, since otherwise the masses would not tolerate them. So, I mean, he's laying it on a little thick there, but I think what we can definitely see is that this whole idea of influencing the masses is behind the Pharisees. And that's, that's indeed what we see in the time of Christ as well. Here's another quote. The Pharisees have delivered to the people a great many observances by succession, from their fathers, which are not written in the law of Moses. So that's a Pharisee understanding, is that there's an oral teaching that comes from the fathers, a tradition that comes from the fathers. And for that reason, it is that the Sadducees reject them and say that we are to esteem those observances to be obligatory, which are in the written word, but are not to observe what are derived from the tradition of our forefathers. And concerning these things, it is that great disputes and differences have arisen among them, while the Sadducees are able to persuade none but the rich and have not the populace obsequious to them, but the Pharisees have the multitude on their side. So you have the rich versus the, the people. And that's how Josephus at least sees the divide between them. I'm sure there were, this was a little bit exaggerated. Uh, there were probably some people that also respected the Sadducees. I mean, they had gone back and forth for a long time, but I think by and large it's pretty a pretty uh, fair characterization. Um, who is the most famous Pharisee of all time? Paul. Paul the Apostle was a Pharisee. He was taught by Gamaliel, a famous Pharisee. Uh, he lived, according to his own words, as a a strictest sect as a Pharisee. Acts 26, 5, he was zealous for the tradition of his fathers in Galatians 1, 14. In Philippians 3, 4, he says, as to the law, he was a Pharisee. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. And so that's uh, a very famous Pharisee we know. It's the kind of Judaism that survived the war. There's a great war that happens in the year 66, from 66 to 73. And it's the Pharisees that survive the Jewish war and become the rabbis, instrumental in rabbinic Judaism, that eventually goes through into the Middle Ages and to our time. The other 
groups of Judaism, at least a number of the, the significant ones, perish in the war, and you never hear about them ever again. All right, just a couple of points about the Sadducees. Most scholars, this is Shea Cohen again, most scholars now agree that the name Sadducee derives from the Hebrew Saduki, which and means a descendant or adherent of Zadok, the priest. Presumably, this is a self-designation, whereas the Pharisees were called Pharisees by others. The Sadducees called themselves Sadducees. Sadducees see themselves as the descendants of Zadok, the priest, that is, the true priests who are to officiate in the temple. According to Acts 23.8 and Mark 12.18, we hear that the Sadducees were so sad, you see, because they said there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit. I don't know if that will help you remember that or not, but they did not believe in the resurrection. And when Jesus goes against the, the Sadducees, or when the Sadducees basically throw their stumper question to Jesus, it's a question about resurrection because they don't believe in it. They work with the priest and the captain of the temple. They can arrest people. The high priest and those who are with him are Sadducees. And so these guys were the power brokers in Jerusalem. All right, on to the Essenes. Oh, I, I forgot to mention. Around the time when Jesus was born, there were approximately 6,000 Pharisees. All right, so we're not talking about everybody's a Pharisee. We're talking about a, small, a smallish group of people. There would be over a million people at, in Jerusalem during Passover in uh, the description of Josephus when he was there. So we're talking about 6,000 people. According to Philo, who lives from 25 B.C. to A.D. 50, basically he lived the whole time Jesus was alive, Philo was also alive, and, and more on either end of it. There are 4,000 Essenes that he is aware of. The Essenes believe the temple was corrupt. And they sent no animal sacrifices to it, but they did send other offering, offerings to the temple. They denied bodily pleasures, and they lived out in the desert in communes. They tended to be groups of celibate men. And you had to take an oath in order to join, and there was a three-year trial period. They emphasized purity and washings, and they wore white garments. Some lived in villages, however... So, you know, generally the Essenes are out in the desert somewhere in, in a commune of sorts, but there would be some that would live in the villages and the, that would get married and have children. They believed in the coming end of days when God would purge the world of evil, establish a new temple, and put them in authority. They would, be, they would consider themselves the remnant, the Essenes, keeping themselves wholly separate from the, the corrupt society. The priesthood in Jerusalem they thought was corrupted, and they said that they were led by the true priests of Zadok, in, in uh, contrast to the Sadducees. who were, So Zadok is a major issue that they're uh, each, each arguing about. Uh, person in, he's a person in the Old Testament. They perished in A.D. 68 during the Jewish War. When the Romans came, the Essenes went out and fought. They said, this is it. This is the end of the world, baby. Sons of light, sons of darkness. Let's do this. And they, they died. And so uh, the reason why we know so much about the Essenes is because the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found near this place called Qumran, we believe are from the Essenes. Uh, although some scholars dispute that, I think it's, it's pretty much uh, a majority that say that that find, the Dead Sea Scrolls, are for the Essenes. All right, on to the Zealots. The Zealots... Um, Josephus calls them the fourth philosophy. So you have the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Pharisees, and then you have the Zealots. The Zealots began with Judah, the Galilean, in the year 6, A.D. 6. He incited a rebellion because the Romans wanted to count all the people for taxes. They wanted to do a census. And so the Romans killed him and his followers scattered, according to Acts 5.37. He's mentioned in uh, the book of Acts. This is what Josephus says about the zealots. They have an inviolable attachment to liberty and say that God is to be their only ruler and Lord. They also do not value dying in any kind of death, nor indeed do they heed the deaths of their relations and friends, nor can any such fear make them call any man Lord. So this is a, the freedom fighters. Um, if they were around today, they would be called the terrorists. Uh, they were... Uh, well, let me, let me 
show you this picture here. This is a dagger that uh, was wielded by the Sakari, an elite group of this uh, revolutionary mindset in the 50s. This is about 20 years after Christ. And uh, that's a 16-inch dagger there, curved sword. The Sakari used these in their, uh, their cloaks to conceal them, and they would sneak around Jerusalem and assassinate, slit the throats of Jewish people who sympathized with Romans. And so they were assassinating um, Roman sympathizers, basically. They perished, as you might imagine, in the Jewish war as well. And uh, they were the ones who committed mass suicide at uh, Masada. I don't know if you ever heard of Masada before. In the year 73, they committed mass suicide rather than be captured at the fortress there. All right, so I want to show you a comparison here of these different groups. So we've got four, and then I put Jesus at the bottom here so you can see him over against these others. So you have the Pharisees, they're held in high esteem by the people. The, you know, a lot of people think the Pharisees know what they're talking about. Whereas the Sadducees, their influence is more the wealthy, the owners, the aristocracy, the Roman governors. The Essenes, generally people think they're great, but they're off in the desert, so you don't really hear much about them, but people generally admired them as holy men. Uh, then the zealots, they would have great influence with the oppressed, the offended, the discontents, the revolutionaries. And then Jesus, the people that he influences are what they call the people of the land, you know, the common person who's just farming or, or doing whatever, because that's where Jesus would spend his time, and those are the kinds of people that would come out to listen to him. Outcasts would come to him, the sick, demon-possessed people would come to Jesus, and that's where he had his uh, influence as well. In, in fact... If you think about it, uh, the, the Pharisees you know, were held in high esteem by most people, and Jesus had his influence with the people of the land. It was really the same group of people that um, they were, they were uh, impacting. All right, so what about these other points? The emphasis of the Pharisees is on interpreting the law, the Torah, and living it out today. And so they had these distinctive beliefs. They believed that not only was there the written Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, not only do we have that, those scrolls, but we also have an oral Torah, the tradition that the fathers have passed down, and we need to obey all of it. Obedience is what really matters. Then the Sadducees, what they really cared about was the temple. The temple is how we worship God. The sacrificial system is what matters. That's how God receives His sacrifice. No resurrection, just do what the written Torah says. A big part of the written Torah is the book of Leviticus, which describes all these sacrifices that the Sadducees would be controlling because they would tend to be the chief priests in the temple. Then you have the Essenes. Ah, the temple's corrupt. These people are too lax. Let's just leave the world behind and go train in holiness. Essentially the ancient equivalent of uh, monks in a monastery. They were into communal living, they were ascetic, they denied their bodies pleasure, and they were preparing for final battle. And they had a strong emphasis on the coming kingdom, uh, like Jesus did, actually. Uh, the zealots, we need to take the land back, that's what they would be crying out. No king but God. Nothing worse than a Roman sympathizer. And their distinctive beliefs, the ends justify the means, and violence is the answer. Whereas, look at Jesus, his emphasis is on repentance. He's, he's leading a renewal movement. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand, um, and he's healing people. Nobody's healing people. It's just not even on the board, you know. He's doing, he's doing fresh things, but then he's, he agrees with the Sadducees that the oral law is not authoritative. And then he agrees with the Pharisees that the resurrection is true, and he agrees with the Zealots that God's kingdom is going to come, and that's when everything wrong with the world is going to be made right. So Jesus has commonalities with all the different groups and then major differences as well because he teaches to love your enemies, not slit their throats with a curved dagger, right? So, I mean, that's a significant difference as well. All right, so I have a few minutes left. Those are the four major groups, and seeing that will help us contextualize ourselves to Jesus' time. But I want to press on to four more groups and I think these will be a lot faster, and um, so let's, let's do it. Are you ready? Can we do this? All right. The first are the chief priests. The chief priests, there will be lots of priests at the time of Christ. In fact, John the Baptist 
his father, Zechariah, was one of the chief priests, or not chief priests, but he was a priest serving in the temple. However, um, the priests could be Pharisees, they could be Sadducees, they could be neither. A lot of people were, no, were affiliated with no groups. They were just doing what they were supposed to do. And so this is from the New Bible Dictionary. The plural chief priest describes members of the high priestly families who serve in the Sanhedrin, ruling and former high priests together with members of the prominent priestly families. So it's, it's made up of these high priests, both the current high priest and former high priests, as well as these prominent priestly families. So in other words, the chief priests tended to be heavily uh, invested in the Sadducees, rather than other groups. Whereas a priest in general could be just affiliated with nobody. A chief priest would tend to be affiliated with the Sadducees because they were the prominent priestly families. And they were the high priests, were the Sadducees. All right, on to the next thing, the Sanhedrin. You see that word there, Sanhedrin? It's not a normal word we use in our society, so I want to describe it for you just a little bit. Oftentimes, that's translated council. This is the leadership body where they're going to make decisions about how things are going to be run as far as the law of Moses, but even the civil law, uh, because the law of Moses included civil law and how the Romans wanted them to run things. So the Sanhedrin was the main interface between Rome and the people. Rome didn't want to have their own people forcing everyone to keep the law. They'd rather work through existing structures to do that. And so the Sanhedrin was... In, in, in a position of authority to govern the people, especially in the area around Jerusalem. And the Romans empowered them to do that, but they, but they did not give them the right of capital punishment. They had to actually go to the Roman governor and say, can, can we execute this person? They couldn't do it themselves. Unless somebody passed from the Gentile area of the temple courts to the Jewish area, and they weren't Jewish, then they're allowed to kill somebody on the spot. But that's the only exception they were granted um, for that. They, uh, basically, their job is to keep Jews from rioting, keep the taxes flowing, keep the temple running smoothly, and spot any troublemakers, whether it's a charismatic leader, a messianic claimant, or a revolutionary. And there were lots of them on either side of Christ. And their, their job was to identify these people and deal with them so that they didn't cause a movement because if there was a movement, the Roman legions would come and everybody would get killed. And that's what ended up happening in the year 66 when the war eventually broke out. So this was not like an empty threat. It was a serious threat that they took very seriously. All right, on to the scribes and then last of all the Samaritans. The scribes basically are people that can write. They can read. They can write. Scholars estimate 90% of people did not read or write at this time. So to be able to do that, that's 10%, right, would be these scribes. And because the scribes could read and write, and the, and the whole culture is based on an authoritative written text, what we call the Old Testament, what they just called the Bible, or the, the Torah and the Psalms and the writings or something like that, um, you needed scribes. You needed scribes to preserve the Scripture, to copy it from one generation to the next. You needed scribes to make new copies to distribute it to other groups that needed it in, in synagogues. You also needed the scribes to publicly read the scripture or else how would anybody know what it says? 90% can't read it. So the scribes had a very important role to play. And because they were so into reading it and copying it, they were considered experts in the law and would sometimes be called lawyers. But there, it's not a lawyer like we think of a lawyer. It's a lawyer as an, an expert in the law of Moses. And what they were able to do was um, transmit Scripture, but also interpret and teach Scripture. And they were financial officials. They were low-level government officials. They would write letters for hire. Paul uses a scribe for the book of Romans, a guy named Tertius, who just has a little shout-out at the very end of it in, in uh, Romans 16.22. And... Uh, you know, it was, it was just a thing that people used. They used scribes to get things done. Uh, and so scribes could be Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, Zealots. They could be any of the groups. Or they could be none of the groups. They were just skilled professionals um, that uh, would do this. And 
In the Gospels, the scribes are usually lumped in with the Pharisees. All right? That's not to say there weren't other scribes that were part of other groups as well. But the places Jesus was, was carrying on his ministry, Galilee, they were usually uh, Pharisees as well. The Samaritans. Samaria was a piece of land between Galilee and Judea. This piece of land is where we find the people called the Samaritans. They believed in the Torah. They believed in the five books of Moses. But they did not recognize the rest of the Hebrew Bible. They thought Israel had gone off, uh, off the mark. That Israel had gone astray. And they believed that Solomon was wrong to build the temple in Jerusalem down here. And they wanted the temple to be on Mount Gerizim up in Samaria. And so that's what they did. They built a temple on Mount Gerizim in Samaria. But John Hyrcanus, one of these Hasmonean rulers, conquered Samaria and destroyed their temple in the year 129 B.C. And so the Samaritans hated the Jews. And the Jews pretty much hated the Samaritans as well. And the evidence I'll give you for that comes from Jesus' disciples themselves. This is Luke 9, 53. But the people did not receive him, receive Jesus, because his face was set toward Jerusalem. So Samaritans are like, you're going to Jerusalem, we're not going to show you hospitality. You can't stay here. And when his disciples, James and John, whom Jesus, by the way, called the sons of thunder, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? What? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. So th those, are, those are just four or more groups. The Samaritans were more geographically uh, located than these other groups. But I just want to emphasize this last point uh, that Cohen makes. Most Jews were not members of any sect. They observed the Sabbath and the holidays, heard the scriptural lessons in synagogue on Sabbath, abstained from forbidden foods, purified themselves before entering the temple precincts, circumcised their sons on the eighth day, and adhered to the ethical norms of folk piety. So people at this time were practicing Judaism, but they wouldn't necessarily be gung-ho and part of uh, one of these elite groups or so, uh, have so much extra time that they could fuss with a lot of the issues that these guys were worried about. So let's take a break and we'll come back and look at conflict.